Forest, and welcome to Character in Context, where I usually teach the historical and ancient sociological context of scripture with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah. But not right now. Right now I'm doing a series about how not to waste your time with bad study practices, bad resources, and just the general confusion that I faced when I started studying the Bible and was trying to figure out what to do and whose books I should even read. Bottom line, I read a lot of nonsense and spent a ton of money on it. I'm going to give you some basics on how to avoid a lot of the pitfalls, um, save money, maximize your time and effort, and get the most out of what you are doing. So the first topic is near and dear to my heart because you guys work hard for your money and shouldn't have to give it to someone who's just making up stuff. And there are a lot of books out there by people who faked their research, presented propaganda as though it was real archaeology and history, passed on unsubstantiated urban legends as truth, or just really hadn't even read enough of the Bible to justify writing anything about it. And if you've read um, enough books about, you know, Revelation, <laughs> those tend to be the worst offenders for those who haven't bothered to truly do their homework. Tim LaHaye isn't the only one out there writing pure fiction. So let's look at some of the easier red flags that you can be on the lookout for in building your own scholarly or theological library. I mean, you know, if you do not live near a university library and if, you know, I, if I live near, man, I'd be there all the time. Number one, if the name of the author is obviously fake or anonymous, this is more of a problem in fringe movements where someone might take for themselves an ancient title or ancient Near Eastern sounding name or something that sounds quote unquote Hebraic to them. Obviously, I am going to hold names like Watchman Nee and Witness Lee to completely different standards because that is what they were called and we know their real names and they lived during times of terrible persecution in China. When authors in the Western world do it, for example, putting Rav in front of their name when they are not actually a rabbi, and if they were a rabbi, they'd just call themselves rabbi. It's generally, you know, a self-designation to elevate their reputation. And, you know, if I was ever to see a book with um, Apostle somebody or... Um, Watchman, somebody, um, except for Watchman Nee, of course, because he actually deserved it, or Prophet, somebody, I would just kind of, uh, no. I mean, I don't call myself Teacher Tyler. It's, uh, that would be silly, all right? You know, if you can't know anything real about an author, be really hesitant to take their spiritual counsel or word on anything. I mean, because there's, if there's no name, there's no accountability, right? Uh, two, titles or descriptions of books that sound sensationalistic. Like 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is in 1988, or the sequel that made the same claims about 89, only there were 89 reasons. I think the 89th one was, I was wrong last year. Or books that tout themselves as being the only book you will ever need to read on a subject. This is a form of manipulation called priming the pump, where you are told exactly what to believe before the person even presents their evidence, if they have any, in order to make you more susceptible to persuasion. Uh, I can think of one exception uh, where two scholars got together and wrote Not Afraid of the Antichrist. You know, really good book by Craig Keener and Michael Brown, both of whom have doctorates. Keener in New Testament Studies, and Brown in Ancient Near Eastern Languages and Literature. Which brings me to number three. Just because someone has a doctorate doesn't mean that whatever they write is something they are actually qualified to write or teach about. Let's say I was just insane, I mean more insane, and didn't leave school after getting my bachelor's degree in chemistry. Let's say I actually went on and got my PhD and, you know, I'm going to have nightmares just having said that. 
Um, if I then got interested in biblical studies and wrote books under the name Dr. Tyler Rosenquist, PhD, but wasn't forthcoming about the fact that my PhD is in a totally unrelated area of expertise, then it would be really deceptive. All right. You would naturally assume that I had a PhD in some sort of biblical studies. In essence, I would be priming the pump to make you think I am more educated than I am in that particular field. As a real life example, I will point out um, Dr. Ernest Martin and his books and claims about archaeology. He's the person responsible for some of the outlandish claims of the temple being down in the city of David, which, by the way, would only work if um, your cubit was six inches long. And the Temple Mount actually being the site of the Fortress Antonia. But a study of Josephus' Wars of the Jews puts a quick end to that. Well, not quick as you actually have to read quite a bit of it. But, you know, well worth the effort. Um, I, I recommend the lobes, but it's really, really priced. Just warning you. Now, he made his claims while touting himself as doctor. But his doctorate was in education and was granted by an unaccredited uh, Worldwide Church of Christ University. Although he was responsible for sending students over to assist in the archaeological digs of the great Benjamin Mazar um, while he was dean of the school, he was never truly involved in anything significant himself. But he's made a lot of money with his claims and is popular among conspiracy groups and um, anti-Semitic groups. So don't feel bad about checking someone out. Google, uh, in this case, can be your friend. And we'll talk about how to do that some other time. Uh, four, let's talk about footnotes. Vague footnotes might as well not even be there and is usually a sign of a person not studying. As an example, someone was telling me that Tertullian had said that Christians, uh, that Christmas, excuse me, came from Saturnalia. Of course, I knew this was nonsense because Tertullian mentions absolutely nothing about Christmas or about the celebration of birthdays. He lived in Tunisia, in Africa, and died around 220 of the Common Era. And the first publication of a proposed birth date of the Messiah never even happened until 20 years before that, all the way over in Egypt. And... And those dates were all in the spring and late summer. So I asked for a source because no way am I going to read everything Tertullian wrote to check on his claims. The early church fathers is not one of my areas of study. You know, we all have to draw the line somewhere, although I do dabble in it when I have to. The footnotes. Oh, so anyway, she sent me an article on the Internet, one that makes claims and then actually had footnotes. The footnotes all read Tertullian. Tertullian, just FYI, wrote over 40 works. So if somebody actually had to read his stuff and they had proof, they would share it, just saying. Another example is Alexander Hislop. And he had some footnotes, some, but the problem is he would cite an entire series of books, wouldn't even narrow it down to a volume, much less give page numbers, and so you literally have to read everything to check up on his claims. <clears throat> when you do, you will find that he misrepresented and cherry-picked his factoids out of context and a lot of stuff he just flat out made up. Number five, expired research. Um, yes, research can go bad. <laughs> it won't give you salmonella, though. Um, there are some fabulous older books out there. But the truth is that research often has an expiration date. New archaeological finds sometimes completely change the way we view things in the Bible. Unearth a new ancient Near Eastern legend or law code or other cache of secular or religious documents and they change the landscape of what we believed we knew before. The past 200 years has so changed the landscape of what Bible scholars thought they knew that much of their commentary has to be tossed out. You know, they did the best they could with what they had. 
And they could never foresee us finding this stuff. Um, and I'm not dissing them at all. In fact, if they could return from the dead, they would probably be giddy as schoolboys with all the resources they now have available. And I say schoolboys because they were all guys back then. <laughs> they just were. Um, I know that when there is a new discovery, discovery that changes something I've been teaching, it's more exciting than I could say. No one particularly enjoys being proven wrong, but if your goal is to learn, then you just get used to it. The only way to be right all the time is to refuse to study. I mean, you're still wrong, but at least your ego doesn't know it. In this case, the research wasn't necessarily bad, although sometimes it was. But we just know more about the world of the Bible now. Uh, six. People teaching linguistics without any formal education in ancient languages. And this is actually a big part of the reason why we have so many terrible teachings out there about the Tetragrammaton, you know, the four-letter name of God in Scripture. And let me just be clear. Everyone has, had, has heard their chosen pronunciation in dreams. I have personally heard two of them, depending on which one I was convinced of at the time. Dreams alone can never lead to doctrine, guys, okay? You know what? It's okay to ask, and it's okay to dig deep to find out a teacher's qualifications. I am straight up open about mine. I am not formally educated in biblical studies. My Hebrew and Greek are deplorable. I am not an archaeologist, scholar, historian, or theologian. But I do know more than Alexander Hislop. Uh, you know, what I do read is, you know, uh, is what the experts write. And not just one expert and assume their point of view is the only one, but, and bringing it, you know, I bring what the experts write down to a more accessible level for people without the time or money to do it themselves. I am nothing but a layman who reads too much and spends way too much money on books. But I will always give you my reading list. Or as I like to joke, when people call me one of those things, you know, I am not a scholar. I just play one on the radio. Or I did, or I, I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night. Now, I'm not hurt when my credentials are questioned because I don't have any. <laughs> but if you want to know who the people are who teach me, uh, they are credentialed. I, I will definitely send, send you their way. Seven, no peer review. Obviously, my blog posts and books fall into this category. I'm not going to lie. I am not accountable to scholars because they don't know who the heck I am and they have no reason to read my books. However, I also try very hard not to make claims that I cannot substantiate with actual evidence. And sometimes one will slip by, it, you know, it happens. And when something is just my personal opinion, I will usually just admit that before giving you that opinion. But with scholars, theologians, historians, linguists, archaeologists, etc., they have to answer to their peers. If one scholar makes an outlandish claim, it will not go unnoticed. It will be challenged by people who are experts in the field, and this is called peer review. Their peers, their equals, their co-laborers in the field of study read their work and find the flaws. That's why it's important to read more than one book on a subject to make sure that you didn't end up reading the one dude with loony ideas about a side issue. I've sadly done that before and taught it as though there was some sort of scholarly consensus as the one true way to think about a subject. Books are far more likely to be peer-reviewed if they have reviews posted from other respected scholars, have detailed and specific footnotes, and have a substantial resource list in the back. Eight, if the book is dedicated to proving that things are pagan, hidden by some grand conspiracy, or attacking everyone except those within a small niche group. These books are never written by scholars because anyone who studies enough comes to find out that all these sorts of books are written by people with agendas who haven't given enough thought or study to the areas they are speaking about. Alexander Hislop, sometimes mislabeled as a historian, was soundly denounced for his two Babylons by his fellow Protestants, not even Catholics who it was attacking, Protestants, almost 200 years ago as being utter nonsense. And between then and now, 
The deciphering of the Rosetta Stone has debunked some of the sources he used, revealed that his assumptions were largely based on disinformation, blatant racism, and mishandling of legends, chronology, and an almost complete lack of knowledge of Babylonian anything, much less two Babylons. And most, if not all, books today written to denounce things as pagan are based upon his propaganda pamphlets, which is where he published his book from. Uh, nine, speculative books. These are hard to identify. A great example would be anything dealing with Paleo-Hebrew quote-unquote word pictures, also called agrobiolinguistics, because of the speculative nature. You know, um, but be it's because of the speculative nature that this is a very popular thing because people enjoy puzzles, but it is a subject without even one iota of documentation or any other kind of proof. Paleo-Hebrew can't be proven to be anything but a font, like Times New Roman. Um, it would be ancient times pre-Roman, actually. Oh, uh, never mind. Um... Anyway, it's a font, okay? But meanings have been assigned by people, you know, very recently, like over the last hundred years. Maserote books are also a big offender. Uh, the word Maserote occurring only once in scripture and interpreted to mean constellations because the context would appear to support that, but it is really still just a guess. It isn't actually until the 10th century that we see the word mentioned outside the scripture defined as meaning constellation, but when the scholars of the 3rd century uh, BCE translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek in the Septuagint, um, they evidently had no real idea what Maserot meant because all they did was transliterate the word, using Greek letters and sounds as best they could to duplicate it. Even though Greek has a perfectly good word for words for things like constellations, astronomy, and astrology. Uh, books about Melchizedek, Nimrod, and anything that is barely mentioned or is confusing in the Bible tend to inspire very long-winded books full of opinions with really nothing behind them to back them up. 10. Book quality. There are a lot of niche books out there that fall into this category. Really, if a book written during modern times has, you know, access to good quality pictures uh, of, say, you know, images of Tammuz and Ishtar, but instead uses really darkened and obscure ones so that they can misrepresent those images, it's best to run and not walk. I actually did a blog years ago, I think it's seven years ago, about the claim that Tammuz was carrying a cross. Sure, it looked like it from certain books, but if you've actually seen the relief in question, you know, one, we don't know it's actually Tammuz at all. It could be a sure. And two, those are very clearly branches with large leaves and not crosses. Um, you know, you're investing money in materials. Make sure it's well spent. When there is a picture in a book, it should be properly labeled so that someone can find where it is from and study it. 11. Memes are never an acceptable source of credible information. You know, memes, those little posters that you see on social media, they're the descendants of the propaganda posters and short speeches developed during World War I as a way to hit and run a crowd with incredible claims in order to generate outrage, without actually having to back up those claims with legitimate information. Because there's no space, right? And there's no time. Hence, there are memes out there about Artemis, Ishtar, Tammuz, obelisks, and a hundred other things making claims that can't be backed up because there isn't enough space. They work because people's suspension of disbelief has been compromised by shock and anger. Ask for sources. I guarantee you they won't have any. And we'll prove it by telling you to do your own research. Or they'd give you hislop. <laughs> um, if they had a source, they would give it. Some teacher, Same with teachers and book authors. People who do the work love proving it. You know, look at me, I know stuff, and I read big books. Okay. Twelve. Uh, Pastor Google and Rabbi YouTube have their uses. 
but know that YouTube doesn't run credibility checks on the people claiming to have the knowledge required to teach you linguistics, history, theology, or whatever else they are pushing. And don't even get me going on the internet prophets or we'll be here all day. Google is useful for some things, but I guarantee you that if you type in is such and such true, you will get a million people telling you that it's true. If you type in is such and such a lie, you will get just as many people making their case it's a lie. Google is the very place to go if you just want to prove yourself right and possibly the worst place for finding out what's actually true. YouTube is just as bad. I mean, people can teach anonymously, and I don't listen to anyone whom I'm not able to check up on. No accountability equals not being worth my time. Same with social media and people who want to teach but under assumed names. Too many con artists out there, and when they get found out on one account, they just switch to another. So, um, good scholars, theologians, historians, or whatever, come from all denominational backgrounds. I read Jewish, Protestant, and Catholic scholars because they have devoted their lives to a field of studies. And sometimes when it's archaeology, uh, I'll listen to a Muslim scholar too. Um, I uh, might not listen to a person to that person on doctrinal issues, but if they are a top-notch scholar in the area of, say, you know, honor and shame or justice and righteousness or numismatics, which is the study of coins, then it makes no difference where they are on their weekends. I respect the integrity of their research. It's arrogance to turn aside an expert because you don't care for their take on the Trinity or infant baptism. As for finding out about the good resources, we'll talk about that more next week. Learning who the experts are isn't something that happens overnight, although having a friend who studies is very helpful. Once you know who the experts are, it's much easier to ask people for their sources. If someone, say, is talking about paganism, but don't know the names of Karel van de Toren, Gwendolyn Leake, Stephanie Daly, or any number of others, but does know Alexander Hislop, Lou White, Ralph Woodrow, Richard Rives, or the program Sunburned, or Truth versus Tradition, then you know that they haven't been introduced to the idea of what is and is not a credible source. And you know what? <clears throat> that was me once. I'm not mocking anyone, but the truth of the matter is that scholarship within the Hebrew Roots movement, the Messianic movement, the out-of-church movement, and just whatever fringe group you want to name is very poor indeed. Poor beyond belief. Big fish and small ponds have been able to get away with dishing out urban legends and propaganda because they haven't taught the people they are teaching how or even what to study except for their own materials. Um, it's like citing your all your books in your own bibliography and that's all that's there. But it's very important to me that you know your options and who has and hasn't done the hard work required to be taken seriously. It's so easy to be taken in with bad sources and to not understand that you can ask questions and even what questions should be asked. If you can't ask questions, I'm telling you right now that your teacher can't be trusted with you and your family's spiritual education. A teacher might say, I don't know, and that is perfectly acceptable. Unless they are claiming, you know, that what they were teaching was absolute fact, then there's a problem. Don't settle for platitudes, guilt trips, or runarounds. A person might not have an answer right in front of them, but they should be able to give it to you, if they actually have one. And you don't need to take anyone's word for anything. And if you're expected to, that's a huge problem. You deserve to at least have the opportunity to learn as much as the person who's teaching you, and no one has the right to withhold that from you. This is the competition to see who can know the most. This is a labor of learning together and building the kingdom as a team, with the next generation knowing and accomplishing even more than we could because we were generous with what we had. Okay, so that was bad sources. And... Uh, Next week, we're going to, um, oh, we're going to talk about, um, what makes a source good. See you then.